Kia ora. Welcome to the final episode in our election year series about child poverty. This week we'll focus on how the incomes of poor families can be boosted to help address child poverty. We'll also discuss how you can help to make child poverty an election issue and pressure politicians for meaningful action to address our national shame. Aotearoa used to pride itself on being an egalitarian country, but that's changed over the past 30 years, with the rich gathering an ever-growing proportion of the country's assets and top earners seeing their incomes rise into the stratosphere. At the same time, the low paid have seen their incomes decline in real terms. This is the case both for beneficiaries and for the lowest paid workers. We take a very short-term approach to issues in Aotearoa and focus on the immediate costs of policies rather than looking at the long-term economic, social and human benefits that would come from eliminating child poverty. We have three interviews this week about incomes, child poverty and how the position can be improved. First, let's speak to Associate Professor Susan St John from the University of Auckland and Child Poverty Action Group. Kia ora Susan, welcome to the programme. Thank you for having me Katrina. How important is income in reducing child poverty? Ah, well, we've got 205,000 children who live below the very lowest poverty line. Income is critically important, but the problem is that it's not the only issue. And as soon as you start talking about income, people say, well, what about housing? What about this? What about that? And we can't just give poor families money. And so it gets sidetracked. Child Poverty Action Group says all those other things are critically important, but income is really fundamental. It's the way in which families participate and belong to society. Having sufficient income to be able to choose nutritious food over poor quality food, to be able to put petrol in the car to get the child to a game of soccer, all of these things are absolutely fundamental to a family's well-being. Do you see problems with how incomes are provided to support poor children in Aotearoa? Unfortunately, we see very big problems. And I think it is probably helpful if I just quickly look at the three errors that we have made over the last 20 years. So if we go back to 1991, the benefits were cut substantially in the 1991 budget. And that precipitated a huge rise in child poverty. That was one error. At that same time, the family benefit, which went to caregivers for the children in the family, was rolled into a targeted payment so that there was one payment made to the caregiver, which then reduced against family income. Now, from that point, that payment lost value because it wasn't properly adjusted for inflation. So the second error came in 1996, when the government correctly said that the family support payment had fallen behind and needed to be adjusted. But what they did, unfortunately, was to say, we'll give each child $20 a week more, but we're not going to give it to every low-income child. We're only going to give the full $20 to those children who are in families that are independent from the state. The other families got $5 per child per week. And that was the second error, that we started to differentiate and have the deserving and the undeserving children based on this theory that you had to provide an incentive for parents to be in work. But what actually happened was we intensified the poverty of those that missed out. Now let's fast forward 10 years. 2006, the government finally decides to do something about child poverty and we have working for families. Actually, it was introduced 2005. But 2006, they took the child tax credit, which was that $15 that didn't go to the, the undeserving children, and they made the discrimination worse. They changed it into $60 per family with $15 more for the fourth and subsequent children. And they made it harder to get 
So you have to meet certain hours of work. A sole parent has to be working 20 hours, a couple has to be working 30 hours to qualify, as well as being off a benefit. You can't be on even a student allowance and get this very important payment. And so what happened was that child poverty fell as a result of working for families, but not amongst the very poorest families with the very poorest children. So what needs to be done now to improve family incomes and assist children in poverty? Child Poverty Action Group has said that as a very first step we have to eliminate this discrimination by joining Working for Families Up and paying it on the same basis to all low income children. Now unfortunately, even if we did that today, it doesn't make up for the fact that those families have missed out for years and have had considerable erosion of their assets. We've got a lot of work to do, but that is a fundamental first step. Other steps involve doing things like making sure that the level of benefits is adequate and that when beneficiaries earn extra money, that they're actually rewarded amply for earning that extra money. At the moment, we've got a system that treats them very punitively. And the third thing that critically must be done is that family assistance delivered through Working for Families must be properly indexed. And so it should be adjusted not only for prices but also for wage growth and all parts of it. Currently we've got some very perverse policies in place which are actually reducing the value of Working for Families for the working poor. It is really a very disgraceful situation. Mm. We're also a very low wage economy and we tend to emphasise parents being in paid work and we don't really seem to value parents being at home bringing up children. How important are those issues and what do you think needs to be done there? There's been a real blindness to see the value of the work that women do bringing up the next generation, nurturing and caring for young children. And because we've refused to see that and we've, as a society, said to families, you only, have, you only have value if you're contributing to the paid workforce. We've got ourselves in a terrible muddle. It's interesting to note that they don't do this in Australia, that they don't differentiate this way. And unfortunately, we don't look to Australia, we look to America or we look to other countries where the child record, the record on child poverty is not perfect or not good and we shouldn't be looking to those countries. What could we follow from Australia? In Australia, the family tax credits are paid without differentiation on the basis of who's in paid work and who is not. And they also have looked after the newborns much better than in New Zealand. So in New Zealand, some newborns are supported with paid parental leave. A very few number of newborns are supported by a discriminatory tax credit called the parental tax credit. And a whole raft of newborns get nothing extra. It, it is a real disgrace that we are not taking seriously the care and nurturing of the very young child when we know that the long-term consequences of not doing that work are going to rebound on society. Sounds like there's a lot of change needed. Thanks very much, Susan. Thank you. Thank you. Now, let's hear from AUT Associate Professor Gail Pacheco about young people, education and training, and the minimum wage. Kia ora, Gail. Welcome to the programme. Kia ora. What can you tell us about young people not in education, employment or training? Well, they're commonly known as NEETs uh, and there's um, always a concern about youth that are NEAT because they're likely to have a lifetime of poorer outcomes so they're likely to be um, less chance of them in being employed later in life, more likely to have health problems or lower levels of well-being. Uh, and the current level of NEETs in New Zealand is about 11%. Um, so it's a lot of young people who are inactive at the moment. Mm. And what about the impact of the minimum wage? Mm. Well, the minimum wage in New Zealand at the moment is $14.25 um, and it applies to anyone who's 16 
and over who are not starting out employees. Um, the impact in, of the minimum wage on varying outcomes, so it sort of depends what outcome you're interested in looking at. Um, I've done a lot of research looking at the impact on poverty and we actually find that it's a very blunt instrument and has very little impact on poverty. Uh, and that's because there's a lot of uh, minimum wage workers that are spread across the income distribution and many of them are teenagers. Um, so the lowest income households are necessarily including a lot of minimum wage workers. So I, in my opinion, I think it would be a poor tool to try and lift the minimum wage to help those poorest ha households. You almost need a more targeted uh, intervention to help the lowest income households. And what might that be? It will depend on the various changes to the benefit system or working for families and uh, someone would need to look at that more closely to look at those areas to see uh, what would be a targeted tool for helping those households because I don't think the minimum wages, uh, we can see the minimum wage seems to be affecting mostly teenagers uh, and it's not necessarily helping the lowest income households. Um, I think in some research I did just a couple of years ago, we looked at simulations of what would happen if you increased the minimum wage by 10% and then we looked at if there was no employment losses, uh, so that's the best case scenario, what would happen with the lowest income households and it only reduced poverty by less than one tenth of a percentage point. Mm -hmm. So it's not a tool for poverty I don't think. No. Thanks very much Gail. Uh -huh. Now it's time for News of the Week. Both Labour and the Greens are proposing that a new Cabinet portfolio of Minister for Children be created if they form a government after the 20 September general election. The Westminster Government suppressed the views of the Scottish Government and sought to claim that its welfare reforms would lift children out of poverty, according to a United Kingdom media report. The story says that the Westminster Government asked for the Scottish Government's input into a report on implementing the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, but then withheld the Scottish Government's position from the final report. Newspaper Hawke's Bay Today reports that the issue of poverty in Hawke's Bay is being hotly debated, with the gap between rich and poor in the province under scrutiny. Children's Commissioner Russell Wills said that District Health Board statistics showed the region had one of the poorest populations of children in the country. He said that more than half of kids born in Hawke's Bay were born into the bottom three income deciles. That meant that the children were disadvantaged before they were even born. Hastings Mayor Lawrence Yule said his perception was that the gap between rich and poor in the region was growing. Children from poor families are at a double disadvantage if they go to private or voluntary nurseries and preschools, according to research published by the Nuffield Foundation. The report shows that disadvantaged children not only fall behind in language skills before they start at nurseries, but the gap then widens because the standard of provision is worse. The paper says that standards in the private sector in disadvantaged areas are lower quality than those in places serving more affluent families. The researchers said that the children most in need of good quality early provision were the least likely to receive it. Maternal deaths and child mortality in the most challenging parts of the world can be dramatically reduced when efforts are made to improve services to mothers and children, according to new research by Save the Children. Since 2000, Afghanistan, Bangladesh and Nepal have each cut maternal death rates by around two-thirds, while China has reduced maternal mortality by almost half, says the State of the World's Mothers Index. The index also shows that some Western countries are falling behind. In the United States, the risk that a 15-year-old girl will die during her lifetime from a pregnancy-related cause has increased by over 50% since 2000. American women now face the same risk of maternal death 
as those in Iran or Romania. United States President Barack Obama's Feed the Future initiative has reached almost 7 million smallholder farmers and helped to save 12.5 million children from the threat of hunger, poverty and malnutrition in the past year. The initiative operates in 19 countries in Africa, Asia and Latin America. More than 20 million Mexican children and adolescents, almost 53% of the under-18 population, live in poverty, according to a study by UNICEF. The research also found that more than 4 million young people live in extreme poverty. Child poverty has declined in Mexico in recent years, mainly as a result of the implementation of social programs. However, children still represent a larger per capita share of the nation's poor than other age groups. 25% of children under the age of one are not covered by the Universal Health Insurance Plan. Approximately 14% of Mexican children suffer from slow development, often as a result of malnutrition. Now let's speak to Professor Jonathan Boston about his new book with Simon Chappell called Child Poverty in New Zealand. Kia ora Jonathan, welcome to the programme. Good to be here Katrina. We take a very short term approach to policy issues in Aotearoa influenced heavily by our three year election cycle. So we look at the immediate costs of addressing child poverty but we don't mm. tend to consider the long term costs of failing to deal with it. Yes, and the long-term costs are considerable. There have been very, various estimates of how much child poverty costs a country like New Zealand with the sort of rate of child poverty that we've got. And the estimates are anywhere between 1 and 4 percent of GDP per annum. So that's anywhere between $2 billion a year and $8 billion a year in terms of the costs uh, that we're bearing or the, the income we're missing out on. And this is because child poverty damages people often over the whole of their lives. It, it has consequences for their educational attainment, for their health status, for the uh, level of employment that they're able to enjoy and of course for the wages that they can command. So it has consequences all around and some of those consequences fall on the whole of society making us all the poorer, which is one of the reasons we need to think seriously about investing now for the long run benefit of the whole community. What's the scale of the challenge in addressing child poverty in this country and what strategies do you think we need? Well, the scale is significant. I mean, we have uh, a fundamental problem that many uh, families have totally inadequate income uh, given the costs of living. We have some huge problems in terms of uh, the affordability of housing and poor housing quality. Uh, and if you look at the gap between what many people get, for example, someone who's wholly dependent on a benefit, and what they would need in order to cross uh, one or other of the various poverty thresholds that we can identify, the amounts are very significant. So, for example, if you took a family of two adults and two children who were wholly dependent on a benefit, uh, if you look at it after housing costs are taken into account, uh, in order to cross the 60% median sort of threshold, in other words, 60% of household disposable income, median household disposable income, you would need almost another $300 for that kind of family uh, to get across the 60% threshold. Uh, almost $200 a week uh, to get across the 50% uh, threshold. So if we wanted to ensure that uh, all or virtually all families in New Zealand uh, uh, cross the 60 percent threshold, um, you're talking about increasing uh, family incomes at the bottom end uh, by uh, very substantial amounts and the fiscal costs of that uh, are significant. So the challenge is great but uh, there are ways of doing it. Uh, in my view we need a package of proposals. We need uh, to recognize that uh, we need an integrated sort of holistic approach to this and ideally we need a long-term approach that will stick over time. So my view is we should seek to have a multi-party uh, agreement of the kind that we reached 20 years ago for older people in which we basically try and agree on the goals we're trying to achieve. 
such as su substantially reducing child poverty and improving the outcomes for children. We try and agree on the sort of principles that should guide policy and, and then come up with some quite specific proposals that are consistent with those principles. One of the principles in my view is that uh, we should focus particularly on uh, young children and on children in severe and persistent poverty. Uh, another is that we should uh, endeavour to identify what we regard as an adequate standard of living uh, and then try and uh, arrange our policy instruments to deliver that adequate standard of living. Another, uh, another uh, sort of principle, in my view, should be that we, we focus on providing income support when children are young and as children get older, perhaps once they're at school, uh, we should focus on strong incentives for parents to enter the, the labour market and, and boost their incomes through employment. And, and finally, in terms of principles, I think we should seek to index uh, assistance to families uh, to both prices and wages so that you know, whatever the level of adequacy that we've determined is appropriate, uh, that is then sort of benchmarked uh, forever uh, against the standards of living uh, for the rest of society. At the moment, most of our uh, forms of assistance for families are either not indexed or only partially indexed. And that, in my view, is completely unacceptable. And moreover, none of our forms of family assistance are indexed to wages, unlike New Zealand superannuation. How do you think the public and political climate could be created so that parties would want to enter into a multi-party accord to address ch children in poverty? I mean, as you mentioned, mm. they managed to do it for superannuation. Why doesn't there seem to be any indication that they'll consider doing that for children, mm. apart from the fact perhaps that children aren't voters? Mm. Well, I think we, lead, we need leadership. Uh, from the wider community, from the business community, uh, from civil society organisations, from the academic community, people like myself. Uh, I think we need uh, a clear uh, desire in the community to do something about this problem. And, and I think the, the concern about child poverty is, is certainly growing, according to the opinion polls. Uh, I think we, we need to try and generate a national conversation uh, about these issues in a careful, reasoned, evidence-informed way that highlights the magnitude of the challenge, uh, the fact that we can do something about it, recognising there will be costs involved and recognising that we need to uh, take those costs seriously and find ways of, of funding those costs. Now, in my view, uh, politicians are sensitive to public opinion and many of them are uh, you know, people of goodwill who, who recognise that children matter, they have rights, uh, they have uh, an entitlement to be treated well, just as our older people are, and that we should, um, for all the reasons we discussed earlier, invest in their future. So my feeling is we, if we can build that kind of level of public support and we can have adequate leadership from the wider community, then the politicians will, will eventually, hopefully, you know, respond. And I think uh, we need to emphasise as part of this process that having a multi-party approach to this is desirable because as a result of that we can have long-term settings and that we can begin to solve some of these problems which are long-term problems um, over time. I mean, you know, addressing the challenges in the housing market can't be done overnight. This is going to take a generation which is another one of the reasons we need a multi-party approach to this. We can't constantly have stop-start policies in this sort of area if we want to make progress. So. Um, other countries have managed to reach uh, you know, agreements across the political spectrum on ways of addressing child poverty. In Britain, they have a Child Poverty Act, which was uh, enacted with support from the three major parties, the Conservatives, the Labour Party, and, and the uh, Liberal Democrats. In Scandinavia, they've had a broad policy consensus across the parties uh, for a generation or more uh, about what constitutes adequate incomes uh, for families and I don't see why we can't do that here. Mm. Just in the one minute we've got left, um, it, it will be expensive and money will need to be invested but it's not we don't have the money, it's a matter of 
choice. Yes. I mean, this government and the last government have spent billions on tax cuts. Yes. So that money yes. could have been directed elsewhere. Sure. And we've, uh, we're going to spend something like $20 billion on rebuilding Christchurch out of the public purse. Well, you know, we found that money, or we will find that money. And, and I don't think any New Zealander would resent the fact that we're doing so. It makes sense. Uh, likewise, we need to recognise that children matter. Uh, they are our future. Uh, we should be investing in them. We should be treating them fairly and that there are the resources in the community uh, to provide the kind of assistance that children need in order to flourish. Uh, in my view, uh, there are some modest expenditure switches we could do, uh, but probably the majority of the money will need to come from additional tax revenue. And in that regard, we have to reckon on the fact that we're one of the few countries without a, an inheritance tax. We don't have a broadly based capital gains tax. We have a very low top tax rate uh, by international standards. So I don't think there's any question uh, of finding the resources if there was the political will to do so. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katrina. That's the end of our series about child poverty in Aotearoa. But remember, New Zealanders head to the polls on 20 September for the general election. Let's take this opportunity to put child poverty on the political map and ensure that politicians know this is a crucial issue for voters. You can help improve the lives of poor children in Aotearoa. Contact your local MP and tell him or her that child poverty is a major issue for you. Write to the leaders of the 10 main political parties and let them know that you won't vote for any party that doesn't have a detailed plan to eliminate child poverty. Go to political candidates forums and ask questions about child poverty. You can also help by speaking to your friends, family and colleagues about child poverty and by supporting groups campaigning against this blot on our nation. If you've missed episodes of our series, you can view them on YouTube. Look for the links on the Child Poverty Action website or on my YouTube channel. And remember, make your vote count for children on 20 September. Kakitano.